Hey guys and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program! My name is Twitchy and the last time we hurled two identical space stations up into Kerbin orbit so we could move them onto the orbit of the Mun and Minmus all in the name of tourism management. This time we're going to completely ignore that and launch ourselves some interplanetary probes. Once again my name is Twitchy and welcome to my final career. We start as always in the vehicle assembly building. We have one and a half million credits to our name and we have a destination of Moho to reach. Moho of course is the uh, interplanetary destination that we're going to get a window for me going to most often. Obviously with Moho having the smallest orbit it means it goes round its year the quickest and it means that it gets into the ideal position relative to Kerbin the most often. It's not the easiest target. The easiest target of course being Eve or Juno depending on which one you want to go visit first. Of course I'm not talking about landings there, I'm just talking about interplanetary travels. But even Juno are going to wait for next episode. Today as I say Moho we're going to send a robotic probe out there because we want to get some altimetry data, we want to get some science data and we just want to know what that nice little ball out there looks like. My first, largest, and most pressing concern is of course making sure that this robotic probe can communicate with Kerbin when it is all the way out at M a Moho, two entire planetary orbits over. Thankfully with the upgraded tracking station it means that all of my antenna are working at peak efficiency. One of the first things I did was to make sure that my tracking center got as upgraded as possible so that these interplanetary missions would be as smooth as possible. Of course, after communication and control, my next priority is the science. I'm using the SM6A service module from the Making History DLC. A lot of people rag on the Making History DLC as not really being worth it. The parts do actually have a few little gems in there that really do make it, to my mind, worth it. But of course, Making History all about that mission creator. But I've got that... that payload bay up there. I have filled it with all the science that I have and of course the ScanSat modules as well to let us get some altimetry data and such forth for Moho because of course we're going to need to find out where there's some flat ground for our future base. Of course we're going to have a future base on Moho. Why wouldn't we? Continuing the naming convention that we have been using for our exploratory probes to the Mun and to Minmus, we are calling this one Mohic. And with this, we have basically built the entire payload that we're sending. We've got the communications, we've got the control, and we've got the science. So underneath, we need to put ourselves a nice little boost stage, something to be able to like circularize when we're at Moho, maybe do some corrections when we're on our way. But if that is just a, a supplementary part of the vehicle, of course, the biggest and most pressing issue is going to be getting off of Kerbin. Having a look at the Delta V map, it gives me an idea of how much fuel I'm going to need at each individual stage. I'm going to go with the FLT 400 fuel tank. I feel like it's going to give us a nice rounded situation there. And I'm trying to think about what type of engine I want. I have immediately put down uh, an LV 909, replace it with a Cheetah, check a poodle, come back to the Cheetah, and decide that actually the Cheetah engine, apart from the Making History DLC once again, is going to be the engine of choice here. The wiki tells us that it is a, an engine that fits particularly between the the LV-909 and the Poodle. So this seems like a great place to use it. Going through and having a look at this craft, it doesn't quite have the fuel that I need to be able to make it into a Moho captured orbit. I'm expecting this to go swinging through from Sun orbit into Moho orbit and that means we need about 4,040 Delta V to be able to capture, at least according to the Delta V map. We have on this vessel about 2.1 kilometers of Delta V so uh, we're going to have to make up a lot of that loss from the Poodle booster stage. Thankfully that is not too hard to do because the booster stage is where we get to go completely over the top and put down as much fuel as we want. As always I'm going to use a few adapters to try and make my way out to the larger sized fuel tanks, having a look around seeing if there's any nicer ways to do that and I decide that actually the single structural adapter there is going to give us a nicer profile. It doesn't really matter if we're pulling a little bit of dead weight up into orbit with us because of course we're going to go absolutely overboard. Looking at the engines, the main cell has to be the winner here. We are lifting a very big craft so we're going to need a very big engine to go with it. And those two meter tanks and the main cell very much doing that job, but we are still a little bit short of the Delta V and necessary, so we're going to need to put some booster stages around our central boosting stage there. We toy around with the idea of one meter asparagus staging around the outside. I just like the idea of having a two meter stage on the inside and one meters on the outside, but it wasn't giving us enough fuel that we needed, so we had to upgrade that to making all of the outside asparagus stages the same as that central stage there. That means that we have got a whopping seven main cells, lifting up about half a million kilogram 
kilograms of a rocket there, giving us a delta V of 8.2 kilometers. But I am still not sure if this is enough. And what do we do in Kerbal when we're not sure? That's right, more boosters, as you can already see on screen. I have put myself six thoroughbred solid fuel boosters there. These are one of the largest available to us, and that has finally given me the confidence to feel happy about this rocket. 8.6 kilometers delta V, 2.4 thrust to weight ratio, the best part of quarter of a million credits. I think this is going to make it to Moho. Apart from a few final checks and some staging to sort out, let's get to the launch pad. Nighttime launches are the best in real life. I'm not sure if this holds true for Kerbal as well, but with the ambient light boost, we can say 3, 2, 1, let's go. All right, we are taking off with the full power that we have here. I go and immediately start taking a little bit of a gravity turn, but because I've got myself pointed towards progress, and the connection between my top shuttle and the rest of the craft is not so strong. We have quite a strong oscillation put in. I decide just to leave it and wait until my solid fuel boosters burn out. If I try and do anything while the solid fuel boosters are going, we are going to have some troubles. Staging happens beautifully. Look at this. I think I think this is beautiful and majestic to watch. Of course, with those stages being thrown at the same time that we are not thrusting, these guys are going to be traveling with us in that parabolic arc that we have as our trajectory right now. This means that when I try and uh, point myself to, towards the horizon and use my engines to try and slow myself down just a little bit on that rotation because uh, I didn't put enough SAS on the boosters, we end up flying towards those stages that we threw. No problems though. This is a bit of a problem though. So much of oscillation that we actually end up having to cut our engines just to make sure that we don't end up shaking the craft apart. We've got a little bit of time until Apple Apps, that's pretty good. Got to make sure that I can open up my solar panels with the action groups. I mean, this seems like the perfect time to do that. Why would it not? But as we are coming up and over our Apple Apps, I'm going to make a small burn to try and turn the craft a little bit stronger. And then when we are pointing prograde, burn until we get that nice circular orbit. We've got about eight days to wait. Uh, I'm going to go away and do a whole bunch of moon stuff, but in the meantime, Mohik has been waiting for us in a Kerbin orbit here. The Kerbal alarm clock tells us that we are ready to go. Do we still call this the Kerbal alarm clock? This is like the built-in alarm clock that comes with Kerbal 1.12 now. I mean, it is an alarm clock in Kerbal. I'm going to call it the Kerbal alarm clock, not to be confused with the mod that is now absolutely obsolete. If I was recording this video a couple of years ago, at this point I'd be talking to you all about the relative angles of Moho and Kerbin and ejection angles and the right speed to leave and all that. But thankfully, because we've got this alarm clock feature, we don't need to know any of that. We just need to wait for the right time and get ourselves a maneuver node. If we're going down towards the sun, we want to leave Kerbin retrograde. We want to go backwards from the way of Kerbin's orbit. And if we're going up, we want to go forwards, prograde to Kerbin's orbit. And that's literally all you need to know. You just then slam down your maneuver node and like me, experiment until you get that. Oh, don't forget to set the target of your of the planet you want to go to, else you, you won't see the markers that you need. I was a bit vague talking about just experimenting with maneuver nodes. Let me give you a rundown with what I was doing. For my first maneuver node, the one that is ejecting me out from a Kerbin, I am making sure that the periapsis that I get given around the sun is about roughly the same altitude as Moho. If you hover over Moho, it tells you what altitude, and if you hover, hover over the periapsis, it tells you what altitude. Make sure those two numbers are within, I don't know, 1% of each other or something like that. Then throw down another maneuver node on the in inclination node because of course if we are not coplanar we will not end up at the same place at the same time we'll end up either north or south relative to the sun from your target and of course in space when you miss by a little bit you miss by at least a lot of time you've got to wait for the orbits to realign and for you to get back around there it's probably cost you a bunch more fuel than you intended to so you try to avoid that and legitimately unsure how long the transfer window is open for us it used to be back in the day that I would launch a craft literally the moment that I saw the planetary alignment happen of uh, that is, of course, taking a line from whichever planet I'm going to, to the sun and over to myself, and then just waiting for the right angle to pop up. But now with the wonders of the Kerbal Alarm Clock, I'm quite happy just to send a craft up there. I, I generally don't open that much technology between me sending a craft up and me launching it. Wait for next episode for the exception for that. But anyway, we are making our ejection burn right now. We're going to be leaving Kerbin. Of course, we've got to make sure we are going retrograde, but that's what the wonders of the maneuver node is all about. I did make a little bit of a stage just as we were leaving. Uh, I was just using up the line last of the fuel on the outside stages. This does of course mean that I now have six bits of debris around Kerbin that I will have to worry about at some point. There's even some debris in the inter interplanetary space that I'm gonna have to get out there and try and save at some point. I have no idea why I went to the space center right now. I'm gonna leave the footage here because it's just weird that literally all I did was go in and come out and just uh, have a look at this. But isn't this great? I love this shot. This is amazing. The planetary, the atmospheric effects that are going on there, the slow curve of the horizon and the spaceship. Managed to get myself 
blow the panels out to make sure that we do not run out of electric. And of course, now we are ready just to float for about 44 days. We need to leave the Kerbin system. We need to make our way about halfway to Moho because we have a great big inclination change to worry about. As you can see from the yellow line there, Moho is inclined quite a bit to the sun, at least relative to what Kerbin is. So we need to come towards this maneuver node here and just make a small burn up into the normal direction. I say it's small burn. You can see there's about two kilometers worth of Delta V to be done there. Probably actually the hardest bit of this entire mission right here. The burn is long and arduous. Remember, right now we are watching this at four times the speed. You know, two hours gets down to about 20 minutes like that. And still, I am going uh, still as long as I am talking. We get down through that stage and I think, right, okay, maybe the maneuver node isn't the way to go at this particular point because the maneuver node requires you to be at a very specific point in your orbit. Whereas I, as a human being, I can eyeball all the figures that are going around here and know whether to, uh, to carry on boosting or not. And with that, I have managed to get my orbit intersecting with Moho and I can make very slight trim maneuvers here to bring ourselves over the top of Moho. I originally was aiming for an equatorial orbit but of course this is a scanning satellite. I want to go over the poles. But whilst I take care of that small trajectory change and do a little bit of administration in the background, like changing a few ships' names and stuff like that, I want to take this moment right here and thank every single one of my Patreons. Scrolling up the screen right now, on the left-hand side, you can see the names of the guys and girls that are keeping me focused and on track. When my friends text me out of the blue and are twitchy, please, please help. We are stuck underneath the Arctic ice and there seems to be something coming after us. I'm going to have to save my friends. No. I am being paid. I am being paid by these people online to produce this entertainment and to make sure that the videos keep on flowing. These guys are keeping me fed and watered whilst I'm at university, whilst you, you are off running on adventures all the time whilst I'm busy. I mean, seriously, guys, why is this? Can we not? But anyway, I would like to take a moment to say thank you very much to all of my patrons, and I hope you too will join me in thanking them. Like, seriously, how do, how do they do this every time I'm busy? Like, all the time, I just don't know. Anyway, Antarctic complaints aside, I have put down my maneuver node, but a maneuver node does not a correction burn make. We've got 54 meters per second to change our velocity by, and this is quite a small number compared to the kilometers we were doing earlier. So I've turned down the thrust of my engine and gone through a time warp to try and get to the maneuver node. And we've just got this very, very gentle tickle through to try and get ourselves up over the poles. We were aiming for the equatorial because that is just the pattern that I've got settled into when I'm arriving somewhere. I like to try and get equatorial so that I can go to a space station or whatever. But for scanning satellites, that is not the way we want to go. Once we've got that up over the poles and then slam down a maneuver node for our capture put a Kerbal alarm clock in place because of course whilst this video is following this mission as one solid thing on the streams we've had a whole bunch of stuff kicking off at the same time i've got a tourism network we're going to different planets a whole bunch of stuff going down so i've got to use the alarm clock to its greatest advantage there but anyway we are very close to entering the moho sphere of influence and from about that point onwards we will be watching this mission in its entirety you you can see Moho off in the distance there, the closest planet to the sun or Kerbal, whichever way you want to say it, that is fine. We're going to drift our way down, checking out a few contracts that we completed in the background. Don't worry about that. That is uh, for, for last episode, in fact. We've got ourselves a two and a bit kilometers. I think that's a two and a half kilometers per second delta V change to enact on ourselves here. That means we are screaming through this system so fast that if we didn't try and slow ourselves down we will just exit out the other side that's not great that is not what we want we of course want to get ourselves if you haven't told already captured in a polar orbit here just making sure that i wasn't going to run out of fuel on the way around i was expecting to enter the moho sphere of influence with a bit of my boost stage left and we've actually come in without any of that but that turns out to be fine because the majority of the extra delta v that i needed was to do the inclination change coming from kerbin to moho and of course we've done that already so this is in entirely down to getting a circular orbit. Turns out I waited just a little bit too long. It's not the biggest problem in the world, though it is going to waste just a little bit of fuel. We are trying right now to slow ourselves down to get the blue line to go around Moho, but if you zoom all the way out to the solar system view, you can see what we're actually doing is trying to get the yellow orbit to match the same orbit as Moho. One of the wonderful things about Kerbal Space Program is it shows you that there are different frames of reference to be thinking about your spaceship in. Either you can think about how you are capturing around Moho, or you can think about what the what the orbit is doing back in the solar system. Of course, you're trying to make that match Moho so that you are drifting together. And then whatever happens around Moho is just 
it's just kind of noise from that point of view. The capture happened beautifully. We got close to a circular orbit. There are a few things that I need to make sure happens here. One is that our periaps isn't so low that we can't do the scansat, and the other is to make sure that our apoaps isn't so high that we can also not do the scansat. But it turns out I've got both of those done, and it's time to get ourselves some science. I'm not sure exactly how many science points we've got here, but I do know we've got eight times the amount of science we have from Moho than if we had did it around the orbit of Kerbin. So that sounds like I'm going to get at least at least 1,200 points of science or something like that. I guess this is one of the big failings of these robotic unmanned missions. You're transmitting science back home and Kerbal's like, great, you've done the science, here's your science points that we have to do a multiple to on. But if you've not recovered a craft at, at Kerbin, it doesn't actually give you the total points that that actually is. Which, uh, yeah, okay, fair enough, I suppose that's fine. But I, I really would like to know at the point of transmission how much science I earned there. And even going back to the Kerbal Space Center, it won't tell me how much I've got. It's not like when you recover a craft. Anyway, we have to do the final bit of scanning and that means we are going to be leaving Mohik around Moho here. It needs to go around and get that little triangle that you can see on my map there to cover every single part of Moho. This way we get altimetry data, we get a visual map and then we get a whole bunch of very useful information for when we come back with a manned mission and maybe even a base. But with that I am going to say thank you very much for joining me for this adventure ladies and gentlemen. I will see you next time where we're going to send a craft off to Juna and we're going to have some problems sending a craft off to Eve. I'd like to once again thank every single one of my patrons and I will see you guys next time where we're gonna do that. Bye!